Friendship News Hour presented to you by Bummer Dude Media. Today is March the 1st, 2023. The rent is due. His name is Alex. My name is Frank. What's up? Um, <laughs> the name Charles Lindbergh mean anything to you? Uh, no, I don't think so. Charles Lindbergh, the aviator? Charles Lindbergh? Mm-mm. Hindenburg? No. No, that aviator, but do not know Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, the, uh, the namesake of our airport here in San Diego, Lindbergh Field. Oh. On this day in 1932... His 20-month-old son was kidnapped. This was like the biggest story ever. Oh, damn. They went through a bunch of – there was a ransom note. They they requested $50,000 and then another ransom note, and they requested $70,000 and told the the Lindberghs where to drop the money off, and they did. And they never got their baby back, and then they found his body discovered near the mansion – no. He'd been killed the night of the kidnapping. Very sad. But where this story actually turns out to be um, kind of interesting outside of the whole kidnapping is they found the person who killed the baby from a marked bill from the ransom. Wow. So the bill that this person used at like a gas station became flagged. Like, could you imagine? Like now that would never happen. There's so many dollar bills in circulation. There's no way you could track like an actual number right. on, on a bill, but they when did. When was this? I'm sorry. 1932. Oh, back in the 30s. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. Jesus, man. Crazy. Crazy shit, man. I don't know. Like I, I couldn't ever imagine a crime today being solved by a marked bill. Right. What a great, yeah. like cheerful way to open an episode too. Sorry. <laughs> dude, I, I, I thought you would I thought you would have known about the, the Lindbergh baby. It was, dude, it was like, uh, I can't, I, I don't know. I only know this because my grandma was around. And- yeah, I was going to say, in your area, that's probably a huge story here. It's like, I, I don't know. That's got to just be San Diego folklore. Not even folklore, but <laughs> a true folklore. story. <laughs> happened. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, you know, before I start the show, sometimes I'll like, uh, I'll look up like, you know, what happened in the state yeah, history. Yeah, right, right. And um, that was a big one. I don't know. I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was more prevalent it's good though i mean honestly the way that like murder porn and like crime podcasts are today yeah maybe we should do it more because people like it especially females which i'll never understand like the thing behind that like guys we have mm-hmm. we have sports i guess we kind of have video games like some females play video games obviously but seem have you ever noticed like does jack sarah is all into like oh, yeah, morbid and crime junkie and all these like different podcasts and like I can't, I cannot get into them, dude. I just, I can't. She's watching the um, Murdoch uh, uh, yeah. documentary right now. I want to learn more about that because that sounds like a crazy case. It seems like he's lying his crazy. ass off in court right now. Crazy. Crazy. Oh, yeah. For sure. <laughs> he's like completely sure. bullshitting in court. Oh, yeah. No <laughs> doubt. No doubt. I mean, he's taking the stand in his own murder trial. Yeah. That, tell you, that should tell you all you need to know. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, like 95% sure he did it. And he's just kind of like, well... Got nothing to lose here. I'm guilty. Might as well take the stand. Right. See what happens. Yeah. Um, no, the, and well, his life story is pretty crazy too. The whole family. It's just a bunch of uh, what's the word for like being rich and like first world problems? Not yeah, not really. Do you remember that case? It was down in Texas. The person used being rich as like a a defense <laughs> against why they did what they did. No. What? What is it? They, okay, let me see if I can yeah. find a synonym. Go to the Google. For rich. That's because, crazy. Um, they use this as a legitimate excuse. Um, uh, affluenza. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Being affluent made them unawares of their crime because they were born this way and they had no idea of, you know, uh, I guess of right or wrong in that situation. Did that I, work? I, forget him. I don't believe so. Oh, my so. God. What a great lawyer. We're going to make up a term. Ethan Couch. <laughs> the affluenza team. Now, he got two years in jail. Okay, good. That's um, crazy. So wow. I think it was like a like a hit and run or a heresy. On the evening of June 15th, 2013, according to authorities in a trial testimony, Couch was witnessed on a surveillance video stealing two cases of beer from a Walmart store, driving with seven passengers in his father's red 2012 F-350 pickup, speeding at 70 miles per hour in a designated 40-mile-per-hour zone. Approximately an hour after the beer theft, Couch was driving his father's truck at 70 miles per hour on a rural two-lane road where motorist Brianna Mitchell's sports utility vehicle had stalled. A couple people came out to help her as had youth minister Brian Jennings, 
Couch's truck swerved off the road into Mitchell's sport utility vehicle and then crashed into Jennings' parked car, which in turn hit an oncoming Volkswagen Beetle. Couch's truck then flipped and struck a tree. Mitchell, Jennings, and both Boyles were killed. And Couch was, and his seven teenage passengers, none of whom were wearing seatbelts, survived. Damn. And he used defense of affluenza. That's wild. What a lawyer. He used a psychologist to do it, too. Uh, G. Dick Miller, a psychologist hired as an expert by the defense, testified in court that the teen was a product of affluenza and was unable to link his actions with his consequences because of his parents teaching him that wealth buys privilege. Holy shit, dude. <laughs> I mean, lean into it. You know I what guess. I mean? Yeah, at that point, fuck it. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, the only, crazy. only one of those shows I ever got into, though, was do you ever uh, to live and die in L.A.? You ever listen to that podcast? No, pretty, I have not. Pretty interesting story, but... I just, yeah, I really want to know what it is. I, I would love to ask more females and get, get what it is about. Like, is it that they're planning to kill us, Frank? Should we be worried? This seems this seems like an epidemic. I think there's like a, I mean, there's a thrill. To, right? That's what it to is. Murder. It's a, it's a thrill. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because it's like, you know, you, you don't want these things to happen. But if they're going to happen, I want to know the details. I want right. to know everything about it. But also, is it like, I want to know how they fucked up so that if I ever need to kill them, I'll be mm. all right. You know what I'm saying? Nah. You know what I'm saying? Nah. <laughs> Not really. Well, you missed a real good nerd fest last week, Frank. You really did. Yeah, I, I saw. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, man, it wasn't a bad episode, but it was hard to keep me in it. <laughs> enthralled. I'm surprised you listened to it, honestly. Jeez. <laughs> well, I had a six hour, six and a half hour drive oh, home okay. from Vegas. Okay, good. Yeah, it was... Uh, Great episode. Thanks again to Rager and uh, Carnage for coming on with us. It was good stuff. But yeah, I'm sitting there in my head. I'm just thinking like, Frank would not fuck with any of this. <laughs> I should be sitting there just kind of like twiddling my thumbs, <laughs> nodding along, thinking about what's for lunch. Yeah, exactly. But solid episode. I love learning out with them. So good. Yeah. Good. But um, hey, does the, does the name Scott Adams mean anything to you? Nope. Have you, what about Dilbert? Oh, yeah. I heard about this guy. Yeah. Wild yes. stuff. What did he say? I don't know what he said. I'm gonna. Oh, we'll go. We'll, we'll go through it <laughs> trepidatiously. <laughs> oh, okay. This is um, not. You know, not great. Not good. What he said. I'll, I'll play a little bit and then I'll stop. Uh, well, Rasmussen poll uh, had a uh, provocative little poll today. They said, uh, "Do you agree or disagree with the statement? Uh, it's okay to be white." That was an actual question. Rasmussen asked, you know, white and black voters. And and probably others. Uh, do you disagree or agree with the statement? It's okay to be white. Twenty six percent of blacks said uh, no. It's not okay to be white. Twenty one percent weren't sure. Add them together. That is forty seven percent of black respondents were not willing to say it's okay to be white. That that actually that's like a real poll. This just happened. It is a real poll. Mm. And if Scott Adams were to have stopped there, probably would have been just fine. Um, I'm going to show you the poll. National survey of 1,000 American adults conducted February 13th through the 15th of this year. Statement. Do you agree or disagree with the statement, it's okay to be white? Okay. Scroll all the way over to those respondents, race, who responded. Of those who were black that responded, we don't know how many there were, 42% strongly agree it's okay to be white. 11% somewhat agree that it's okay to be white. 8% somewhat disagree it's okay to be white. 18% strongly disagree that it's okay to be white. And 21% are not sure. So if any of these answers, any of these response is not strongly agree that it's okay to be white, then you don't agree that it's okay to be white. Right. I, it, yeah. yeah. Right? Right. So if we're, if we're using that as the benchmark, what he said about 47% or almost half of the respondents said – that it's not okay to be white. That in and of itself is an interesting thing to talk about, right? That's get over my skis here, Al, but that's kind of like how stuff like the Holocaust starts where people start to begin to think that it's not okay to be who you are as an immutable fact, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever, something that, you, that you're born with. You let me know when you think Scott Adams goes too far here. Did you have any idea? <laughs> would, would you have imagined that that could have happened? So I realized, um, as you know, I've been identifying as black for a while, years now, because I like, you know, I like to be on the winning team and I like to <laughs> help. And I, I always thought, well, if you help the black community, that's sort of the biggest lever. You know, you could you can find the, the biggest benefit. So I thought, well, that's the hardest thing and the biggest benefit. So I'd like to focus a lot of my life resources in helping black Americans. 
So much so that I started identifying as black to just be on the team I was helping. But it turns out that nearly half of that team uh, doesn't think uh, I'm okay to be white, which is, of course, why I identified as black, because so I could be on the winning team for a while. But I have to say, uh, th- this is the first political poll that ever changed my activities. I don't know that that's ever happened before. You know, normally you see a poll, you just look at it, you go, ah, whatever. You know, oh, this is interesting what other people think. But as of today, I'm going to re-identify as white because I don't want to be a member of a hate group. I'd accidentally joined a hate group. So if, if you know, nearly half of all blacks uh, are not okay with white people, according to this poll, not according to me, according to this poll, uh, that's a hate group. That's a hate group. And I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I would say, you know, based on the current way things are going, the best advice I would give to white people is to get the hell away from black people. Just get the fuck Jesus, away. dude. Where, wherever you have to go, just get away. Because there's no fixing this. This can't be fixed. You just have to escape. That's a great outlook. So that's what I did. I went to a neighborhood where, you know, I have a very low black population. Because unfortunately, the, you know, there's a high correlation between the density. And this is according to Don Lemon, by the way. Um, so here I'm just quoting Don Lemon when, when he notes that the, when he lived in a uh, mostly black neighborhood, there were a bunch of problems that he didn't see in white neighborhoods. He just continues to dig the hole. Yeah, man. Not good. So <laughs> I don't know, man. Like what? Where, where, uh, who, who? Uh, dude, there's plenty of people that probably think just like this, dude, man. I, like that, that sadly is a, is a larger chunk of America than I think we give it credit for, to be honest with you. Probably. And regardless of what this poll says, and you might think, I, I think it's kind of you know disgusting to look at somebody's as a mutable characteristics and say it's it's not okay to be that right sure but yeah. what he said is not america right that's not us there's no room to say you can't get the hell away from black people get as far as you can away from black people have nothing to do with them you don't think that's part of america at all well i'm not saying i'm not saying it doesn't exist i'm saying i'm saying that's not who we aim to be but it's who we've allowed like we've allowed the clan to be in america for 200 years No problem. Like, that's a hate group that's been here openly against black people and other races for over 100 years. You know what I mean? And and that's that's been allowed and is heavily participated in. So, man, the poll itself, like that is a triggering question or kind of like a a slanted question. But I could see off of some people's life experiences how they might say, like, it's really like, hey, I don't really trust white people based on like the shit I've seen in my life. But to just like assume is is that's also ignorant, in my opinion. But I could see how you'd have a slant one way or the other if based on your life experiences, white people have been shitty to you, you know, or in anyone in that case, you know, he's he's making it sound like black people have been pretty shitty to him. So I guess that's how he feels, why he feels how he feels. But I don't know. Yeah. So that's what got him canceled. It's what got uh, Dilbert, um, one of the longest standing comic strips removed from syndication. It was on some like 2000 some odd newspapers used to love that gone. cartoon man like when i was a kid oh yeah i, I haven't really party. read comics in a while but yeah i'm more of a family circus guy myself. are you nice uh, i love the family circus it's a great comic that's one of my favorite parts of sunday morning yeah let's get the comics what was the one calvin and hobbs i think i used to like that one a lot too calvin and hobbs yeah. peanuts garfield garfield yeah peanuts. yeah uh yeah it, it you know that and that video was going around quite a bit I, you know one of the things that was interesting is that it was really hard shocker to find any solid reporting on this. How so? What do you mean? Well, because it was all like, like Dilbert creator makes racist statements. Mm-hmm. Nobody was saying what he said. Yeah. I never, nobody was saying, yeah. you know, nobody was saying like, here's the video. Here's a link to what he said. Here's in the context of what he said. I think more often than not, if you take a clip of what somebody said and then you expand upon it into context, then you're, you're able to see a little bit more deeply I mean, here, I don't think there's any, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing to see. Like he said what he said. To a point though, like, I feel like he was not even, I, I agree with his point, but like he was kind of making a, a point, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't being too offensive, but like was, had his opinion, which he's allowed to have in America. But then at a point he crosses the line and it just becomes. Well, yeah. Hateful, and then when like. you, you know, when you start saying things like what he said, then, then all, like all of a sudden now, like the second story of this is that poll, which should be the first story. Mm-hmm. 
right? Because what, what's forgotten in this, what nobody's talking, everyone's talking about, you know, the Dilbert creator's racist and he said all these things and he's gotten canceled and, you know, good for him. He should, you know, good riddance. That's what the editor of the Union, San Diego Union Tribute said. Oh, yeah. Dilbert has been canceled, has been uh, stripped of syndic- syndication, good riddance. Yeah. But I, I think that that poll is really interesting. And I think that there should be way more conversation around that because it's it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous road. It's a slippery slope. Whether or not like you have reason to feel that way or not, it's just, it's just like the same goes for Scott Adams. Even if somebody says that they don't agree that you should be, that it's okay that you're white. If I said, Al, it's not okay that you're German. I don't care what your ancestors did or didn't do. You have dirty Aryan blood in you. You are the son of Nazis and it's not okay that you're German. First, I would tell you it's pronounced German. That'd be the first thing I'd oh, say. Oh, excuse me. But yeah, no, no, I, I see what you're saying for sure, for sure. But I, right. that has existed in America against black people for, I mean, since I've been here. We brought them here as slaves and as much as we fought it and yes, we've had so much progress in the two, 300 years that we've been a country. But like that, that like ingrained hatred for black people has always been, I would say like increasingly smaller identity of our country, but always a present identity. Right, and it, but it could, it could have been about anybody. That's what the aim has been specifically for, for a very long time. I guess we didn't like Asian Americans for some time too during World War II, but like... Oh, and there's plenty of people that are that are like really upset about your immigration status here in the Southwest. Yeah, true. You go take true. that poll in Orange County, you go to Laguna Hills, mm-hmm. and you ask, is it okay to be a legal immigrant? You'll get, a way, you'll get way more than 47% of people saying no. Right. It's not. Right. Right. And, but that's just, it's this, that's the same principle I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's, it it could be white people. It could be illegal immigrants, could be black people. It could be whoever. It's dangerous. It is. To make that statement. Even if you think it's innocuous, even if you think you're just taking a poll and you're just saying it and you're just, you're just putting it out there. Right. Because what you've done is you've irresponsibly said this person's characters, who they are at, at their core, something that they cannot change. Maybe your immigration status you can change, but that's besides the point. That is not okay. It's not okay to be that. Well, what are the options? Can't yeah. change that you're white. Can't change that you're black. You mm-hmm. can't change any of that. Mm-hmm. So the next step, if human history tells us anything, is extermination. It's not okay that you're here, so you must not be here. And it's not – I don't care how that happens. I'm just letting you know that it's not okay. I'm not the one that did that, went and rounded you up and, and got rid of you, right? And, and I'm not saying that, you know. We're going to start rounding up white people. I'm just saying what history tells us is that that's a, that's a very slippery slope. And Scott Adams, he's, he's very popular. He's got a ton of followers on Twitter. At least he did. I don't know if he does anymore. That clip I played, the coffee with Scott Adams, very well attended uh, a program he does every morning. And so, you know, I think he had an opportunity there to rise above. Mm-hmm. And he just took that poll. He took the disgusting aspects of that poll that he didn't like. And then he internalized them, and then he spat them back out at the, and destroyed at another, his career. The people, and yeah, and, and in the process, destroyed his career. Got his comic book uh, unsyndicated. But yeah, man, pretty crazy shit. The thinking divisively like that is obviously a, a large problem. You know what I'm saying? I don't just I don't agree with anything this guy's saying, and I push back just because like that kind of popped in my head. And, and another thing that kind of makes me think about this is, uh, did you see what Marjorie Taylor Greene said recently in Congress? Maybe. She basically proposed, and this is going around like crazy on the internet, that we should split up America by red states and blue states. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. How yeah. does that not lead to the exact same thing? No, that's silly, too. That's the right wing thinking on this is that we should do that. And I don't see how dividing us further among states doesn't just set us back to the Civil War. Like, I, we won't have slavery, I don't think, in the, in the blue or red states. Like, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. But now we're just completely divided on all of our political aspects. How does that not lead to a civil war eventually? Like, I, I don't see how thinking that way is progressive in any way. Like, it, it, it is like the dumbest thing we could do, in my opinion. What, what do you think about that, though? No, I think it's silly, too. That, that's the idea of a, of a national divorce. Yeah. That, yeah, that we just go our separate ways and we're never going to agree with each other. No, yeah, it, it, it inevitably leads to, to, to civil war and, and to infighting. And if I didn't know any better, Marjorie Taylor Greene was a actor from a foreign adversary. Because that is, if you were somebody who was an adversary or an enemy of the United States, the first thing that you would want was just to be completely split down the middle. Let's fuck them up. Yeah, 50-50 right. and, and going at each other's throats. It's, it's, it's a very, very silly concept. It's lazy. And I think it, it, especially if it's coming from the right, anybody who's Christian or claims to be Christian or anybody who claims to be a God-fearing person 
that is so far against the the, the tenets of, of what you're supposed to believe, what you're supposed to be putting out in the world, what you're supposed to be rising up against. And you need to be the the, the person that stands up and says, regardless of what you think of me or my of my beliefs or this, I'm going to love you. And it doesn't matter. You know, you need to be way more like Kanye West saying, I love Hitler than you are. Hey, I want to split us down the middle and separate us as a country. Right. Mm-hmm. You need to love your enemy as you love yourself. And yeah. If I don't hear that from our leaders, then you're 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 just as bad as 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 anybody. I think that's what's always made America great is like our differences. You know what I'm saying? Like that that is like we don't need to agree on everything, but we can learn from everybody. Like that's that's how it's always been with, you know, I mean even down to like food. Like think like think of all the different kinds of food in America and how like through the years they've they've changed and infused and like grown and been mm-hmm. great. Like that is such a cool thing in America whereas if you go to you know, certain countries like in Italy, like you're mostly going to find Italian food there. If you go to a, a country like Poland, like it's it's very that. And I don't think you have as much of that because it's just going to – it's been so concentrated on that for so long. But in America, it's yeah. a great melting pot. Like that is what makes us awesome it, or it has culturally for so long. So, and then now that politics are so much bigger or social media is so much bigger – like it seems like this this wedge that just destroys everything. But like really it's what makes us great. And like from disagreements comes – should come resolutions and progress and change and it seems like that slow that that engine is slowed down here in this country if you, if you look at any other country that you think is doing well whatever, and whatever your metric is chances are that they're a homogenized country there was a guy i forget he was some foreign comic and he had this he had this this bit and it was really good and he was saying like he was like americans are weird because they feel like they're, you know, that they're not doing enough or they feel like the country is, you know, racist or this, that, and the other. He's like, but think of it like this. Throughout all of human history, every single country who has looked at people trying to get in has said, I do not like you and you cannot come in. And they have fought wars against that. Mm -hmm. And the United States is the only country to say, I do not like you, but you can come on in. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and, true. And, and, but, that, but that's that's who we you know that's who we are, and like that's such yeah. a like if you if you zoom back and you look at it from that perspective, like it's beautiful. It's beautiful mm-hmm. that we have been able to do that for so long. And I, I mean, yeah, I think that's gonna that's gonna kind of you know there's gonna there's gonna be some friction there because there's nothing. The more the more it, the more it becomes a mix of everything, then it's harder to. Like you said, what makes us beautiful is our differences. And I think I agree to that to an extent. I think really where our strengths are are, is what makes us the same. Yeah. Where do we have common ground? Mm -hmm. What do we all share? Right. Used to be back in the day that there were there were a lot of common things and that and that if you came to America, you had to assimilate. And now what you assimilated to is now become whiteness. I think that's what this poll ultimately Mm -hmm. resembles is that, you know, Back in the day, it was whiteness, and whiteness has created racism, and it's created Jim Crow, and it created the Klan, and it's all bad. It created these the systems of racist policies and, and, and practices and systems in the United States, which is a, a prevailing thought, especially within our within our liberal groups. I think it's a hundred percent incorrect way to look at it. But let's just take it at face value. That's let's say that what you're saying is true. Then where do we go? What what is our common ground? Because if our differences are what make us stronger or great then that's all we have is our differences. And it seems right now, if we're talking, if we're, you know, if people are putting out in the mainstream that we should be divorcing as a nation, yeah. there are very little that, that is congealing us together. And, and I think that's more or less what we, what we need to start having a conversation about what is common ground. What's, what's, a, what's a common denominator? Where can we move forward and say, you know, above all else, we agree on this. The way that it currently is, I, I think would be much better than perhaps like a new world order, which I believe I think is, is in motion to try to happen right now. Like to all think the same way or like don't step out of line from how this governing body feels or else there'll be severe consequences. Like I'm scared we're heading that way from some things I'm seeing globally. But Mm -hmm. like, would you prefer that? So where it's kind of like, we all think this way or you better fucking think this way or else or like the melting pot differences learning from like what do you think yeah i mean i don't i don't know that there's any any good that comes from a strong hand in anything if star wars has taught us anything you need to start eating bugs and plant-based meat and taking right. your cues from bill gates and and <laughs> and your Klaus schwabs and yeah you know all these assholes who are completely out of touch with what's going on on the ground it, it boils down to culture right and you can either enforce culture which is not culture at all mm-hmm. or you can allow it to flourish and I think that at the at the at the, the crux of it, that's kind of where the the left and right kind of they differ, right? 
either you're allowing for the freedom, the free market of ideas to flourish in, in any way that it presents itself. And then if it gets steps to out, out, outside of, of what is acceptable, what we deem acceptable, right? Then then we say no. A good example of this is what's going on in El Salvador. Have you seen what's going on in El Salvador? Have not, no. All the gang members that are being rounded up? Mm-mm. Like some some, I don't know how many thousands of, of gang members who have very conveniently marked themselves through, you know, dozens of tattoos on their body. This president that got elected, I think in 2019, has had a crackdown. The El Salvador used to be like the murder capital of the world. And he has just rounded up all of these gang members. MS-13 rounded them all up, put them in these oh, big mega prisons, I did hear treating that. them like animals, nuts to butts, running, handcuffed behind the back, running, hunched over, you know, treated like prisoners for the crimes that they've committed in their streets. And so when I look at that, I think, huh, okay, laws are only a choice, right? Our government has given us laws. The boundaries are, are, are those laws and, and either the government enforces them or they don't, but it's a choice. And in America, it seems as though we've allowed for the, the leniency of law to be accepted for the trade-off of being sympathetic, sympathetic or empathetic to somebody's race or gender or whatever, right? Mm. The law doesn't matter as much as your oppression does or your historic oppression does. That to me is not the free market of, of ideas being able to, to flourish because if it, if it were, we would say, okay, these are the laws, we are sticking to them. You have these boundaries. These are the boundaries that you're allowed to work within. And now, now you're, you know, you're free within the boundaries, right? And if you ask anybody in El Salvador right now, anybody that's being uh, interviewed, they're saying, hey, I've never felt more free in my life. Mm. And the government has, has a very strong hand in, uh, in enforcing the laws that are, that are on the books. And here in America, uh, there was a, a, a video going around yesterday of a, of a, a man in St. Louis, in downtown St. Louis, loading a gun, and a homeless man was just sitting on the street, broad daylight, cleaning his gun, loading it, put it to his head, and shot him. Jesus. You know what I'm saying? That, and I see those videos in America way more than I'd like. So, uh, anyway, going back to what I was saying, you either enforce culture through the government, through cancel culture, through not allowing for what should be naturally. You're, 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 you're trying to enforce the culture with a heavy hand, and you're saying... Now nah, the hell with laws, the hell with structure, the hell with freedom. This is how we want it to be, and we're not going to allow you to to go within with, within the bounds of, of of anything. It's going to be how I say it, how we say it. If we don't think you're a good citizen, then we're going to cancel you, Scott Adams. We're going to cancel you. Like, no, I'm, I'm not saying you know he he should continue to have a job. His you know his syndicator has every right to to, to cut him off, but that is an interesting phenomenon. He said the wrong thing. Now he doesn't have his livelihood. Interesting. It's an interesting phenomenon. Instead of saying, this guy is an asshole, you know, I'm not going to watch him anymore. I'm not going to, instead of allowing for us to make the decision ourselves, those above us, the boom was once with the puppet strings have made the decision for us. And I think that's at the crux of it, the, the, the difference here. Yeah. And I think, don't know, but I think that Kanye West used this to his advantage recently. Oh yeah. I honestly don't believe that he is like this white supremacist, non Nazi Hitler lover. I think he used that hate speech to get purposely canceled to break ties with all these companies that he no longer wanted to work with, needed to work with, maybe found out shit about them he didn't like. Uh, for and, and all these companies, since he's left them, have either been fucked or shit's come out about him. Chase Bank yeah. severed his relationship with like a very unprecedented mood. Move just basically said, we don't want your money anymore. You're no longer a member here. Froze his assets. He was unable to get his money for like about a week or something since that happened. We've seen that Chase Bank has, you know, basically been a huge player in the Jeffrey Epstein case. At least specific people have. Mm -hmm. uh, the the exact person that Kanye pissed off has had emails chains with Jeffrey Epstein come out where they're using code words, talking about Disney princesses, all this other weird shit. So it's looking very likely that that Chase, in some way, knowingly helped Jeffrey Epstein human traffic all these girls. Uh, we've seen Kanye break ties with Balenciaga since that came out. We've seen a bunch of child porn shit and just weird shit from them. They've been severely set back. And uh, Adidas, who he was in like kind of not a very friendly uh, contract with towards him, uh, broke ties with him. And in their first quarter earnings, they were projected to lose $1.3 billion uh, and have now, which is insane, renegotiated with Kanye to sell off the remaining Yeezy merchandise they have to try to make up for this loss. He'll be making mm -hmm. over $500 million for that, which is far more than I think he was making before. Uh, I don't know what's going on further with Adidas. I don't know if there's going to be a future relationship again or whatever. This is just to get rid of existing inventory sitting in a warehouse. But I, I do think that Kanye, and this is just me, maybe I'm giving Kanye way more credit than is deserved, but 
I think he used the idea of cancel culture to legally get out of all these these contracts because they broke ties with him, not the other way around. And he's a free man now, can do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah, he's got a lot of making up to do. He hurt a lot of people. Said a, I mean, he said hurtful things. That's, that is not, I'm not negating that. But I do think this is like one of the first times, if this is what he's done, that we've seen someone use the cancel culture to their benefit, which is interesting. 40 chess. <laughs> yeah, for real. Kanye, genius. Yeah, yeah. Genius. So I, um, I don't know. Okay. I, it's interesting. I think this will be the last time we talk about COVID. <laughs> I think. We'll see. Yesterday, February 28th, 2023, FBI Director Christopher Way, Ray said that the COVID pandemic was probably the result of a laboratory leak in China, providing the first public confirmation of the Bureau's classified judgment of how the virus that led to the deaths of nearly 7 million people worldwide first emerged. Quote, this is uh, Mr. Ray speaking. The FBI has, for quite some time now, assessed that the origins of the pandemic are most likely a potential lab incident in Wuhan. Here you are talking about the potential leak from a Chinese government-controlled lab. Does that make you feel a way? I, I think it's been like very obvious for a long time where this most likely came from. I, I feel like there's been a lot of political motivations and liability motivations globally that have made us not say that, but I, th I think it's been like glaringly obvious. So yeah, yeah. it makes well, me feel Well, let's go through those way. motivations. <laughs> in February 17th, 2020, the New York Times, Senator Tom Cotton repeats fringe theory of coronavirus origins. Let's hear some of those fringe theories. We now know that the first case manifested no later than, no later than December 1, even though China didn't reveal it to the WHO until a month later on December 31st, when they continued to hide it from their own citizens. And they continued to say that it had been contained inside Wuhan. Today, it is in every single province in China. They also claimed for almost two months until earlier this week that it had originated in a seafood market in Wuhan, that locals had contracted it from animals in, say, bat soup or snake tartare. That is not the case. The Lancet published a study last weekend demonstrating that of the original 40 cases, 14 of them had no contact with the seafood market, including patient zero. As one epidemiologist said, that virus went into the seafood market before it came out of the seafood market. We still don't know where it originated. Could have been another seafood market. Could have been a farm. Could have been a food processing company. I would note that China, or that Wuhan also has China's only biosafety level four super laboratory that works with the world's most deadly pathogens to include, yes, coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is January of 2020. And you would think that these kind of statements would be investigated by our journalists. If this was true, which we now know that it is, mm -hmm. it would be a massive scandal and the world would have to investigate China for its neglect and its gross incompetence, except it wasn't investigated, Al. Yeah, it wasn't. It was dicked around forever. And isn't, I mean, that same lab is the same lab that, if I remember correctly, we were funneling money into. Fauci himself was funneling money into this lab, correct? Oh, brother, we're getting there. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We are getting there. This is Vox in uh, March of twenty, March 12, 2020. The conspiracy theories about the origin of coronavirus debunked. What do you think those conspiracy theories were that it originated in the Wuhan lab? Yeah. This is Newsweek, April 18th, 2020. As U.S. investigates Wuhan lab leak theory, senior China researcher says allegations are malicious and impossible. This is Forbes, April 23rd, 2020. The controversial rumor COVID-19 originated in a Wuhan lab creeps into the GOP mainstream. You hear that? The GOP mainstream. Mm. Virus research. This is uh, NPR, uh, April 23rd, 2020. Virus researchers cast doubt on the theory of coronavirus lab incident. Vanity Fair, May 8th, 2020. The discussion is basically over. Why scientists believe the Wuhan lab coronavirus origin theory is highly unlikely. Business Insight, uh, May 2nd, 2020. A U.S. researcher who worked with the Wuhan virology lab gives four reasons why coronavirus leak would be extremely unlikely. The Guardian in May of 2020 has an article out saying that basically th these five countries and their intelligence agencies contradict theories that COVID-19 leaked from a lab. Now, good investigative journalism right there, Frank, by the way. Thank you. There, you have to ask the question, why? Why was there so much cover for this very particular detail of the pandemic, which happens to uh, be the most important detail of the past three years? Mm -hmm. Where did the virus originate? If you ask me, the reason that we didn't investigate is very simple. is because the president of the United States, Donald Trump, claimed that it came 
from a lab. And let's hear from him. We're looking at exactly where it came from, who it came from, how it happened, separately and also scientifically. So we're going to be able to find it. And my question is, have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And I think that the World Health Organization should be ashamed of themselves because they're like the public relations agency for China. Mm. And this country pays them almost $500 million a year and China pays them $38 million a year. And uh, whether it's a lot or more, it doesn't matter. It's still, they shouldn't be making excuses when people make horrible mistakes, especially mistakes that are causing hundreds of thousands of people around the world to die. I think the World Health Organization should be ashamed of themselves. And of course, Al, that's racist. Yeah. It's racist that he invokes China. As, the, as the, I don't know if you remember, that's all that anybody could talk about is that the president was racist because he was saying that it came from China. God, dude, and all I can think about the sidebar, how much like more well spoken that was than if old Joey Biden was up there talking about it, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he's not even like the best order. No, you know? yeah, he's say what like you want that. about Trump, but Jesus Christ, if, if he's that much more well spoken than what we got, it's just nuts. Go on. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot of it comes say from it's China. racist. It's not racist at all. No, not at all. It comes from China. <laughs> Oh, man, part of me misses him. <laughs> yeah. He was he was right. Mm -hmm. And our media and, and our leaders were more concerned with how Chinese Americans would feel about the president's word of the act of the origin of the virus. And here's more proof of that. This is Nancy Pelosi in February of 2020, before things got shut down, as uh, Trump had ceased all travel from China. It's exciting to be here, especially at this time, uh, to be able to be unified with our community. Uh, we want to be vigilant about what it might be on the, uh, what is out there in other places. We want to be careful about how we deal with it. But we do want to say to people, come to Chinatown. Here we are. We're, again, careful, safe, and come join us. Mm, so well said. Just, just beautiful. Just beautiful beautiful. So um, she would go on to be uh, a pretty fierce proponent of lockdowns. And uh, in the same calendar year, she would kneel for George Floyd wearing a kente cloth. Um, I think our best performative politician of our lifetime, Nancy Pelosi. No. Uh, however, you if you're the media, you can't just go out and say, we disagree with what the president is saying because he's racist or because we think he's being racist. So you can't put the, the blame squarely on the shoulders of, of the media. Because they had to invoke science or scientists, right? And they were fed misleading information from our scientists, mainly America's sweetheart, Tony Fauci. Here is Tony Fauci on April 17th, 2020, when asked of the origins of the coronavirus and if they could have come from Wuhan. Dr. Fauci, could you address these suggestions or concerns uh, that this virus was somehow man-made? possibly came out of a laboratory in China. You yeah. studied this virus, what are the prospects of that? Yeah. There was a study uh, recently that we can make available to you where a, a group of highly qualified evolutionary virologists looked at the sequences there and the sequences in uh, bats as they evolve and the mutations that it took to get to the point where it is now is totally consistent with a jump of a species from an animal to a human. So a bald face lie. Yeah. Uh, and we now know that it was a bald face lie. And th th this was at the time, April, that was April 2020. We were it was a time of unrest. Right? We had no idea, like just just how bad this was going to be. And we were looking for answers. Not a whole lot of us trusted Trump. The, you know, the past three years, the media spent breaking him over the coals, impeaching him for Russia collusion, things that ended up not being true. Here comes Anthony Fauci, seems like a breath of fresh air. 
except he ended up being the liar that we all thought Trump was. In April of 2020, the Washington Post reported on the conditions of the Wuhan Institute of Virology as told by U.S. officials in January of 2018, two years before the coronavirus pandemic. During in, uh, interactions with scientists at the Wuhan Institute of Virology Laboratory, U.S. officials via cable dated January 19th, 2018, noted that the new lab has a serious shortage of appropriately trained technicians and investigators needed to safely operate this high containment laboratory. Quote, the cable was a warning shot, one U.S. official said. They were begging people to pay attention to what was going on. So we still don't know that it came from the lab, but everything's pointing to the fact that there is a level four bio lab in the exact same epicenter where the virus started. There is evidence of U.S. officials two years ago investigating this lab saying, hey, we need to look at this. This is not safe. Enter Dr. Christian Anderson, professor in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. On January 31st, 2020, Dr. Anderson wrote an email to Dr. Anthony Fauci and others saying, quote, the unusual features of the virus make up a really small part of the genome, less than 0.1%. So one has to look really closely at all the sequences to see that some of the features potentially look engineered. Eddie Holmes, Bob Gary, Mike Farzan, and myself all find the genome inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory. On February 2nd, 2020, just a couple days later, Dr. Robert Gary similarly wrote, I really can't think of a plausible natural scenario. I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature. Of course, in the lab, it would be easy. On the same day, Dr. Michael Farzan wrote, quote, I bothered by the fear in sight and had a hard time explaining that as an event outside the lab, I am 70, 30 or 60, 40 that it came from the lab. On the same day, Dr. Andrew Rambot stated, quote, from a natural evolutionary point of view, the only thing here that strikes me as unusual is the furin cleavage site. That's physical characteristics of the virus itself. On February 4th, 2020, Dr. Edward Holmes indicated that he was about 60-40 that it came from a lab. On February 4th, 2020, Dr. Jeremy Farrar wrote, I am about 50-50 that it came from a lab. Now, despite these private statements, Dr. Anderson's and the other scientists were later involved in the drafting of a publication of a correspondence in the Nature Medicine entitled The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. Proximal Origin unequivocally stated a consensus view that, quote, SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct or a purposeful manipulated virus. Proximal Origin was written by February 4th, 2020, less than 48 hours after each of the authors privately expressed concern on a teleconference that COVID-19 originated in a lab. It is unclear what scientific facts, if any, changed in that short amount of time. Publicly released communications suggest that Dr. Francis Collins, the former director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, hoped that the Proximal Origin paper would put down the hypothesis that COVID-19 originated in a lab and that Dr. Collins, in fact, wanted to do more to silence this debate. Specifically, Dr. Collins wrote to Dr. Fauci, quote, I hoped proximal origin would settle this. Anything more the National Institute of Health can do. Dr. Collins' question about what more NIH could do to settle the debate implies that he, Dr. Fauci, and the NIH were involved in an initial effort to suppress the dissent about the origins of COVID-19. Alarmingly, it appears that the decision to suppress the lab leak hypothesis was rooted in political calculations rather than scientific principles. This is a report that came out of a, a hearing in Congress. And during a hearing in Congress last year, Dr. Martin Mackery, professor of surgery at John Hopkins, sums this up pretty beautifully. Next question is in a recent energy and commerce oversight hearing, I uh, asked the NIH director, um, about the NIH's gross negligence in monitoring the EcoHealth Alliance grant and subgrant at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, after admitting that we might not have all of the information and research reports from the WIV and EcoHealth, he insisted that he was sure that the coronavirus research that the U.S. taxpayer dollars funded at the WIV was completely unrelated to SARS-CoV-2. And I was wondering if any of the three of you had any thoughts on that. Thank you, Congresswoman. The reason this is even an issue 
is that it's embarrassing we funded the lab. If we had not funded the lab, 100% of Americans would say this is obvious, this is a no-brainer. The epicenter of the world is five miles from one of the only high-level virology labs in China. The doctors initially were arrested and forced to sign uh, non-disclosure gag documents. The Lab reports have been destroyed. They've not been turned over. The sequences reported from the lab to the NIH database were deleted by a request from Chinese scientists that called over early on and said, delete those sequences we put in the database. And two leading virologists, maybe the two le um, top virologists in the United States, Dr. Michael Farzan from Scripps and Dr. Robert Gary from Tulane, told Dr. Fauci on his emergency call in January of 2020 when he was scrambling soon after learning that the NIH was funding the lab, they both said that it was likely from the lab. Both scientists changed their tunes days later in the media, and then both scientists received $9 million subsequent in funding from the NIH. It's a no-brainer that it came from the lab. I mean, at this point, it's impossible to acquire any more information. And if you did, it would only be affirmative. Damn. So Damn. let's recap real quick. He's got the receipts. COVID-19 uh, is first detected November-ish 2019. China doesn't report for about another month on the virus. It begins to gain steam throughout December and January of 2020. Anthony Fauci and Peter Daszak discover that the NIH had funded gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology Laboratory for coronaviruses. They scrambled to make sure that there is no evidence to point directly to the exact virus that escaped from the lab. And then they pour cold water on any theory about whether or not the virus came from the lab or not, hoping that they can pin it on a fucking pangolin, right? Mm. Years, a year goes by, year and a half goes by, there's, there's hearings and everybody starts to put the pieces together. Wait a minute. You're saying at a wet market five miles from a level four laboratory that just so happens to investigate and do gain of function research on Corona bat viruses is where the origin of this of this came uh, of this virus came from and not the lab itself. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. So what do we make of all of it? All the lies and all the deceit and, and, and everything. It, it, if you ask me, first of all, the main theme of this podcast for me is never being more true that they do not care about you. Mm -hmm. Your leaders, the people in charge, the people in charge of researching deadly viruses to make sure that they don't escape and infect the world. They don't care about you. They care about saving faith. And I don't know about you, Al, but I will never trust my government ever with anything ever again, especially when it comes to health emergencies and health related issues. And this is like Republican or Democrat too, man. And for all the Trumpers out there that are trying to do a little victory lap, don't forget that he was the one that handed uh, Fauci the keys to this, to this castle, to the pandemic response. He shut down the country. He allowed for mask mandates, even though we had emails in early 2020 from Anthony Fauci admitting that masks do absolutely nothing to stop the spread of coronavirus. And Trump pushed uh, and continued to push vaccines. I say he expedited now the, the approval of the vaccine. Yeah. yeah. And we know now that the vaccines are, aren't worth the vials that they're contained in. Yeah. So, the, the, I mean, I, I don't want to hear anything about Trump. Yeah, he was right about where it came from, but he was wrong on literally everything else. I don't know, man. Maybe, maybe we're just alone on an island here and, and uh, we need to start looking out for each other because yeah. fucking – I don't trust anybody with anything ever again. Lies. The entire thing was lies. That's where the friendship of this news hour comes into play, Frank. Yeah, you betcha, Dude, man. one really quick story. I just saw this. I thought it was kind of funny. Yes. Sometime this year, later this year, it was just announced that we were going to be sending the remains of four dead American presidents into deep space. Yeah, I saw that. And it's just, it's funny. Because, like it, it's a, I guess it's like a gesture. It's an idea. It's kind of like throwing Mount Rushmore into space. If anyone ever finds it, there's some DNA story of what we are, who we are. Based on four great men, the four guys that they're going to send DNA up there is George Washington, Ronald Reagan, John F. Kennedy, and Dwight D. Eisenhower, you know, four presidents that helped us through tough times in our history, I would say. So that they're on the surface. I'm cool with that. That sounds great. You read more into it, and the company that's doing this, uh, the company is called Celestis. 
Yeah, Celestis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they specialize in doing this. The other people that are also going to be in the same pod are founding members of the Star Trek like <laughs> show. And it's it's other sci-fi, like important sci-fi developers and characters. So I just thought that was so weird. Like you got four presidents and then you have Star Trek cast and crew members. It's it's just so weird. It's interesting company. Yeah, but it will it's launching sometime in 2023. Look for that, and I guess the aliens will we'll get to see our some of our great leaders and some of our great so what are they like the shooting up hair and <laughs> yeah. fingernails and shit? It's, it's hair strands yeah. up there. And then I guess like a short okay. description somehow of who the people were and what they did. So, right on. Yeah. Interesting stuff. But I just thought it was interesting that they added the uh, the sci-fi people onto that. I don't know. It's very yeah, hilarious. Be a big Star Trek fan. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's all right, buddy. All. Just want to bring it up. Cool. Bring her on home. Uh, if you want to reach us, you can do so uh, by sending us an email. Bummerdude.media at gmail.com. Um, you can hit us up on Twitter at Friendship NH or Instagram and TikTok at Friendship News Hour. And that's our show.